Stand in honor of God's word, please. We will be reading today from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 through 43. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one. <clears throat> and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, we've come to worship today on this Easter Sunday where we look back over 2,000 years ago, where all appeared dark, where you had died upon a cross. But on this morning, you rose from the dead, conquering sin and death once and for all. You are alive. And not just that, Lord, but you have given us the promise of eternal life itself, that one day, even though in this world we taste death, we taste the pain of it, we taste the hurt of it, one day we will be raised in glory and we shall stand with you for eternity. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Speak now through your servant, and may we, for the short time we're here, block out all distractions, block out all the cares of the world, and worship you and hear your word. For it's in the name of our Savior we pray. Amen. Good morning. We are in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, are we dismissing for children's church today? I believe we are, children are dismissed for children's church. (laughs) 
The title of the message this morning is The Death of Death, Part 2. We're going to focus in this morning on the body of the resurrection. The Death of Death, Part 2, The Body of the Resurrection. There was a theologian once named Eric Sauer, and he wrote the following. I'm going to repeat this a couple times because it will take that to let it soak in. I quote, The present age is Easter time. It begins with the resurrection of the Redeemer, and it ends with the resurrection of the redeemed. Between lies the spiritual resurrection of those called into life through Christ. So we live between two Easter's. And we live in the power of the first Easter as we go to meet the last Easter. Very rich. I'll read it again. The present age is Easter time. It begins with the resurrection of the Redeemer, and it ends with the resurrection of the redeemed. And between this lies the spiritual resurrection or salvation of those called into life through Christ. So we live between two Easter's. We live in the power of the first Easter as we await the last Easter. And what an awesome thought. Isn't it good to gather on this Resurrection Sunday? A hearty welcome to each and every one of you here today, and also a welcome to those who are viewing via live stream today. As we begin this morning with the death of death, part two, the body of the resurrection, let's focus in first of all on the fact that life comes from death. Once again, Paul has an imaginary opponent who raises doubt about the resurrection. And as Paul is writing to the Corinthians, he wants to engage this imaginary skeptic and defeat his arguments with truth from God. Let's take a look together at verse 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what body do they come? Paul repeats the skepticism of his imaginary adversary with what I call holy sarcasm. Any of you ever been exposed to holy sarcasm before? The Apostle Paul is full of it at times. In doing this, he's not being arrogant. Uh, He's simply being truthful. And he's writing as he is being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. It is a righteous rebuke to ignorance. That's why he calls his opponent, his imaginary opponent, a fool. Skepticism about the truth of God is what led the psalmist to write these words. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. Psalm 14, verse 1. The psalmist also said this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments, his praise endures forever. Now Paul, as he is writing, he is writing to Greeks, to Gentiles. Greeks always sought wisdom. In fact, they would gather together on Mars Hill on a continual basis just to discuss wisdom and to discuss some new idea. They liked wisdom. They enjoyed it. It was part of their culture. But Paul said this, He said, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. But praise God to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Now the apostle goes on to answer these questions. The opponent asks, how are the dead raised up? How's that even possible, is the idea. Well, what, what kind of body do they come back with? To the Greek mind, resurrection just couldn't happen. As they thought through the process of death, logically, they realized that when a body decayed, it turned into dust, and in their mind, that's the end of it. There is no such thing as a resurrection. Now, as for me, I used to believe that at the resurrection, every particle of dust would be put back together and reconstructed into virtually the same body, 
It occurred to me as I studied this week that the Bible doesn't actually teach that. Resurrection is not necessarily reconstruction. I like what Warren Wearsby said. He said, there is continuity. The resurrection body is our body, but there is not identity. It's not the same body. It's new. It's a brand new thing that's made like the old. For the Greeks, this was a brand new concept. The Apostle Paul goes on to illustrate. He says, how can resurrection happen? Well, the answer is through death. Death is the pathway, the necessary pathway, for permanent, eternal change in the body. Just as the death of a seed is necessary for that seed to become what it's destined by God to become, a marvelous fruit-bearing plant, it can be illustrated this way. When the seed is planted, it undergoes a process. It varies a little bit on the plant type, but remains essentially the same. And then a sprout appears and grows into a full-fledged plant. But what about the seed? Can you dig up the plant and find its seed down at the bottom with little planty bits growing from its insides? No. It's essentially died to itself. It ceases to be a seed in order that the plant would live. It can no longer find its identity in that of its old self, a seed. And in this way it has died. It has ceased to exist as its original self. It's become something far different and lives a new kind of life. From the potential of life that is contained within the seed comes a new life, capable of producing fruit. Where a seed cannot produce fruit, its plant form can. It can't do this on its own, though. It needs to be planted, nurtured, and nourished. We sow seeds, not plants. Now, Your spiritual resurrection and my spiritual resurrection was necessary in order for us to become a glorious new child of God. Now, would you agree with me that God grants new life as he raises us out of the darkness of spiritual death and breathes into us the Holy Spirit of God? He awakened us to new life at the point of our salvation. Amen? He granted us his life, eternal life. Since Jesus is eternal life, he gave us the gift of himself. Now, in keeping with that thought, as we talk about physical resurrection, it's been promised by Jesus that he would raise us up from the dead. Just as he raised us spiritually from the dead, he would do so physically. And that we would be with him throughout all of eternity. God told Adam, we mentioned this this morning in the first message, that on the day that he ate of the fruit of the forbidden tree, he would surely die. And we pointed out that he instantly died spiritually, and eventually he died physically. We also mentioned that Christ is in the business of restoring paradise. And so it follows that if we're going to be with him throughout all of eternity, that where Jesus is, there we will be also. We must have a body that has been freed from the effects of sin, so that we can abide in the presence of God forever. Now, the Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made in these bodies. Amen? But the truth is, these bodies are not designed to inhabit eternity. We have to have new bodies in order for that to happen. Now, we are spirit flesh beings. That's the way that we've been designed. Angels are spirit beings. Human beings are spirit flesh beings. It's God's design. And so for us to inhabit eternity with God, then it requires resurrection. And as we've said before, God came in the likeness of sinful flesh so that he could bring us to God. He arose, and since he arose, we will rise also. Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, It remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. John 12, 24. So Jesus offered up his life. He offered up his death. Now I think that you'd agree with me that Jesus' life was a beautiful thing. While he was born, and while he lived, and as he ministered here on this earth, 
His body, he said, was prepared for him by the Father. He died as an investment. Whenever you sow seed, what is it that you expect? You expect a spiritual harvest to come from the investment that you made in sowing the seeds. Well, Jesus died as an investment. And just as we sow seeds as an investment for a larger crop, that's what Jesus sowed, and that's what he expects, and that's what he is gaining. And he will keep on gaining as every soul comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now beyond this, as we sow seeds in the ground, we expect to get the same type of crop. I'm not going to uh, sow corn and expect to reap barley, right? Whatever I sow, that I expect to reap. And since we pointed out in the early service today that Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection, and he's expecting a harvest, the first fruit, the guarantee of the harvest that was to come, what type of harvest is he expecting to come? Just like the first. And that is why the resurrection body that we will have throughout eternity will be just like the body that Jesus had when he rose from the dead. And that is an awesome thought. Now concerning the resurrection, what is produced through change is more beautiful than it was before. Now as handsome as I am standing up here on the platform, at least my wife thinks I am. It doesn't matter what the rest of you think. My wife thinks I look good. Ask her. She'll tell you. I'm going to look far better in eternity. <laughs> Somehow I don't think I'm going to be 30 to 40 pounds overweight in eternity. In the resurrection, what is produced through change is more beautiful than it was before. The butterfly is more beautiful than the caterpillar. Amen? We have any gardeners in here? I'm not a gardener. But I do know this, that the tulip is more beautiful than the bulb that goes in the ground. Even Christ, as he is described in glory, as beautiful as he was on this planet, he is radiant in glory, as described by John the Apostle. Paul said, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Let's consider the glory of God's design. Look at verse 38. Verse 38. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, for there is one kind of flesh of men, and another flesh of animals, and another of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory." What are terrestrial bodies? Terrestrial bodies are bodies that belong to this earth. They are glorious because they're designed by God. God does all things well, amen? He does all things well. He made all things according to his beautiful design that came forth from his infinitely beautiful mind. And he designed those bodies the way he did because it pleased him to do that. It was good. The Bible says that he made man a little lower than the angels, and God looked at his earthly creation, and it was very good. Nevertheless, there's different types of glory that are assigned to flesh of different types. With human beings, uh, with all of us, we all differ in appearance, we all differ in color of skin, in intelligence, in personality type, yet we all come from God, right? Right? And we all return to God. We return to the God who gave us life. There are also differences in celestial bodies. Stars differ in brightness and glory according to the word of God and according to science. Moons, planets, uh, comets, stars, all differ in brilliance. They differ in purpose. 
We look at the heavenly bodies that we see in the nighttime sky, and we look at those things with wonder, and we look at the nighttime sky in awe because of the great beauty that we see there. It is so far away, but yet it is so beautiful because it comes from the mind of a beautiful God. There's a difference between the terrestrial and the celestial. The terrestrial, as we've said, belongs to this earth. Now, this analogy in the scriptures, get a hold of this, it corresponds to the first and the second birth. We belong to this earth because we have been born as human beings on this planet, right? We are all naturally born and are part of this world. For the elect of God, however, we become citizens of heaven. We have a celestial ancestry through second birth. Now, our true home as children of God, for those who know Jesus as Savior, our true home is not terrestrial any longer. Our home is celestial. At the resurrection, we are going to be outfitted for our celestial eternity, our celestial existence. And we, don't, we won't need spacesuits uh, to survive. We, don't, we won't need rockets or rocket fuel or space shuttles or anything like that. That's why the redeemed are compared to the stars in this text. Our true home is celestial. As wonderful as that that is, just as on earth life has different levels of glory, so in eternity there'll be different levels of glory. Did you know that some saints will shine brighter than others? We're all going to be shining as the sun, but some saints will be shining brighter than others in glory according to the different levels of sanctification that are achieved as we walk with Jesus during our stay here. While we stay here, we are dwelling in these earthly tents, these earthly tabernacles. But the time is coming soon when we're going to put off those tents those tabernacles. And that brings us to our second point this morning, our permanent tabernacle. The Apostle Peter said, yes, I think that it's right, as long as I'm in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. He was putting off his tent. What that means is is that he was going to die. And his immaterial part would come out of and be separate from his material part. Let's consider the natural body versus the resurrected body. Look with me at verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual or celestial body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. And afterward, the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. When a human body goes into the ground, it is sown, so to speak, like a seed. It is sown in corruption. It's temporary. That means that that body which goes into the ground decays. Actually, according to the rules of the Old Testament, that body is considered to be unclean. It is sown in dishonor, meaning that it is imperfect. It's an imperfect body. The human body is prone to sickness, it is prone to disease, 
It is prone to deformity. It's even prone to biological abnormalities such as uh, mental retardation, Down syndrome, all the effects of the curse of sin in this world. The body that is buried is a natural body that is weak. It is susceptible to, as we said, sickness, disease, fatigue, damage. These are all effects of us living in this fallen world. But the resurrected body is raised to be permanent, not temporary. It is eternal. It is raised not imperfectly, but it is raised as a perfect body with no hint or stain of fallenness upon it whatsoever. No sin stains upon it. It is raised in power. The eternal body, the spiritual body, the celestial body that we're talking about here, it cannot be injured. It cannot grow old. It will never become sick. It will never die. It is a perfect celestial body made to inhabit the third heaven, made to inhabit eternity. We will have the same type of body that the Lord Jesus Christ had as he was raised in power. We will be indestructible. We will not be bound by gravity. We will be able to fly. We will appear and disappear. We'll be able to walk through walls. We will literally be able to be anywhere at will. And guess what? And that permanent celestial body that we're talking about, we get to eat and eat and eat. Amen? And not have to worry about getting fat. You know why? Because there's no such thing as a celestial Weight Watchers plan. We don't need it. Amen, Dan the man? <laughs> and just as Jesus had his glory restored to him after his ascension, as witnessed by John in the book of Revelation, remember when John fell at Jesus' feet like a dead man? As he was overwhelmed with the Lord Jesus Christ, radiant in all of his glory? So Christ is going to share his glory with you. And he's going to share his glory with me. Our bodies will be comparable to the angels. Only consider this. Just as here on this planet, we've been made a little lower than the angels, there we will be made a little higher than the angels because we will have glorified bodies of flesh. Spirit, flesh beings. Our bodies glorified. And while we wait for this, resurrection from the dead and as we look forward to this and by the way the resurrection could happen today because Jesus could return today this resurrection event occurs at the time of the rapture but while we wait for that day while we wait for as our brothers call it that great getting up moaning we have the privilege of being transformed daily into his likeness, even now, spiritually speaking. The physical will follow the spiritual. At salvation, Jesus raises us from the darkness of sin and spiritual death. But then comes the physical, the resurrection of the body. While we wait, we can be transformed into his likeness day by day. We can experience daily metamorphosis. My question to you this morning is, are you a caterpillar or a butterfly? Have you been transformed? Have you undergone spiritual metamorphosis? Metamorphosis is a biological process by which an animal physically develops after birth or hatching. It involves a relatively abrupt change in the animal's form or structure through cell growth and differentiation. Some insects undergo metamorphosis, which is usually accompanied by a change of habit or behavior. 
Consider the monarch butterfly, for example. The monarch butterfly begins life as a larva, which becomes a caterpillar, and then the caterpillar will hang from a tree and form a chrysalis where it will remain for about two weeks. And while inside the chrysalis, God causes the caterpillar to excrete digestive juices, which destroy most of the cells of that caterpillar. And following this, he experiences cell regrowth until a new creation is formed, a beautiful butterfly. By the way, this is what happens to us when Jesus saves our souls. He totally transforms us into brand new creations in Christ Jesus. And as he has done this spiritually, so he will do with us physically. Some of you have heard of Arthur Brisbane. He once pictured a crowd of grieving caterpillars carrying the corpse of a cocoon to its final resting place. The poor distressed caterpillars, clad in black raiment, were weeping, and all the while the beautiful butterfly fluttered happily above the muck and the mire of earth, forever freed from its earthly shell. You know, this transformation is a promise. It's a promise. And that is why the Apostle Paul says the following. He says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And as the Apostle closes this section, in light of this, in light of the fact that you can have the assurance right now that you belong to Jesus, that you can possess right now eternal life, and you can live from this day forward with the confidence every single day of knowing that you're right with God, knowing that you will rise from the dead, and living in light of that. You can be undergoing a spiritual metaphor, metamorphosis day by day as you are transformed day by day into the likeness of Jesus Christ so that you can take on his ways, so that you can perform his actions. And as he lives inside of you, he can have control over your entire being. He can have your mouth. He can have your eyes. He can have your feet. He can have your hands. And Jesus literally is willing to live out his resurrected life inside of you to give you the confidence as you and I go around and we live in a fallen world that is getting crazier by the day with all of its weirdness and all of its uncertainties and all of its dangers, there is nothing like knowing that you're completely right with God. There is nothing quite like being at peace with the Lord Jesus Christ and being at peace with what he's doing in your life right now. That is a peace that this world desperately is searching for. But they will never find it outside of the risen Savior. Amen? Because he alone gives life where there was no life. He alone raises the dead. And I don't know about you, but I remember it like it was yesterday, the day that Jesus had a divine appointment with me. And he spoke into the darkness, which was my existence. And he said, Steve Harrelson, I command you to live. And he raised me from the dead and gave me the faith to believe. And I believed and trusted him for the full and final forgiveness of my sin nature. I've been raised to life, and I want you to understand something. My life has never been the same since. Because he set me on the path just like he's done for you, if you know Jesus. And he says, I lay before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you may live. He can grant life because he's the author of eternal life. And some of you in this room need that life today. And I got good news for you. Jesus is willing to give it to you. Right here, right now. If you're feeling convicted right now, in other words, if you are feeling a sorrow over your sin, and you understand that Jesus gave everything for you to the point where he had shed his precious blood and poured out his life unto death and said, it is finished. And the price of the payment for your sins 
was satisfied by him on the cross. And he bowed his head and died. But three days later, God raised him to eternal life. You know why? So that he could be the first fruits of the resurrection. The promise of the crop that was to come. Are you a part of his harvest? Are you going to take part in that great resurrection from the dead? Know him now. Enjoy the peace that he gives. I'm not, I'm not giving you a promise today that if you become a Christian that your life is going to be great. Oftentimes it won't be. But I can promise you this. When the hits come, you can depend upon him. You can lean upon him. You can trust him. And even though your world could be falling down around you, you'll be able to say, along with the hymn writer, it is well with my soul. It's well with our soul. But it's also going to be well with our bodies. All part of the beautiful design from a beautiful God who loves us and his salvation is permanent. Do you possess it? Do you want to possess it? It's yours for the asking today. Let's bow and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank, we're thankful that when you do something, you do it completely. You do it fully. We are so awestruck and blown away by the fact that you would want us, a failed creation. Lord, you're not the one who failed. We were the ones who failed you. But yet you look upon us with a heart of love and a heart of compassion, and you're willing to save even the worst of sinners. And Lord, if there's someone here today, a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, that needs that new life today in Jesus that we've been talking about, then Father, we pray that you would draw through your Spirit those who need to come to you today. Even in this second service this morning, we extend the offer of salvation as your representatives, Lord Jesus. And if there's someone who needs to be saved, then I pray that they would come and talk to me about how they can know Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. And we can get that taken care of today. We're not in a hurry. We're not in a rush. And we can go somewhere quiet and show that person from the Bible how they can trust Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. But Lord, I also believe that there are some folks here today who are saved but yet they have, they have needed to be reminded that they are brand new creations in Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, for those who are here who have already been saved at some point in the past, they know that they're saved. But they also need to re-engage. They need to find a good Bible-believing local church where they can serve you and honor you as we all await the second coming of Jesus. Lord, I pray that they will not take the talent that you gave them and bury it in the ground, like the, the faithless steward. But I pray that they will be willing to live each and every day in light of the fact that one day they will stand before you, Lord Jesus, and give an account of how they've lived on this earth since becoming a Christian. Lord, I believe that for many in this room, the time of sitting on the sidelines spiritually needs to come to an end. It's time to get back in the game. It's time to re-engage and get serious about our walk with the Lord. And Father, you have given the local church as the means, the primary means, through which Christians come together and go out and fulfill the Great Commission. And Lord, the days are quickly, quickly going by. 
and if there's ever a time that Christians needed to be serious about what you called us to do, it's now. So I pray that you would work in the hearts of believers today and help them to realize how short life is and that eternity is long and that what we do in this life matters for eternity. So Father, I pray that you would help us to always, always, always keep in the forefront of our mind that Jesus is coming back. And Lord, just as we have spiritually been saved, our bodies will physically be saved as well. Our bodies, Lord Jesus, will be just like yours. And we are so thankful for that promise. So Lord, I pray that you would work in the lives of everyone who is here this morning. Help us to leave this place in victory. And Lord, as we ask for some quiet music to be played, there could be someone that needs to step out of their seat and make a decision for Jesus, whether for salvation or to recommit their life to Jesus Christ. And Lord, we'll wait this morning. There may be someone who just wants to come to the altar and, and pray. There could be someone who just wants to come to this altar and just spend time worshiping at your feet. Lord, whatever the need is, as we enter into this time of invitation, the altar is open, and I, as your servant, am available. We want your will to be done, and we commit this time to you, this time of spiritual renewal to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. morning. How are you doing spiritually? I can't think of a better day than Easter Sunday to say, Lord Jesus, here's my life. Take me and spend me in your service. Give me that peace that my heart has been longing for. Lord, help me to remember the great love that you have for me. Any of you need a shot of hope this morning? Then remember what Jesus has done for you. Remember what he will do for you. And be reminded of the plans that he has for you, not only here and now, but throughout all of eternity.